And that would be, again, going back to the Talmud in Hagiga, as we talked about in chapter 2 of Hagiga. So chapter 2 of Hagiga, the Talmud is trying to understand the subtleties, the golden apples and the silver dish of Torah. And it's going through and analyzing word by word. So it comes, it comes to the word Hoshech. Hoshech means darkness. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, the absence of light, where it says God separates light from darkness. But two sentences before that, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, when it says darkness, Hoshech was on the face of the deep, we're told by the Talmud it doesn't mean darkness. It means black fire, black energy, a kind of energy that is so powerful you can't even see it. Two sentences later, it means the, from there on, in verse 4, it means the absence of light. And there's other words. Maimonides brings down examples. Mayim. Most people, Mayim means what? Water. Mayim means water on day three. But in the original statements of water, it may not mean H2O. The word Mayim, although it's spelled exactly the same, may also mean the building blocks of the universe. Interesting. Why? As Nachmanides points out, we don't have words for the, subtle, the subtlety of some of these subtle concepts that are, that are required to understand it. So the Talmud is going through and investigating the development of Genesis chapter 1. And it gets to the, the Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, which says, there is evening and morning, day 1. That's the first time that a day is quantified. There is evening and morning, day 1. And just before it gets to that, the, the, the uh, Nachmanides brings down a discussion on the meaning of evening and morning. You know, does it mean sunset and sunrise? I mean, it certainly would seem to. That's certainly the English imp imp implication. But the, there's a problem with that. And Nachmanides points it out. That the text says there was evening and morning day one. Evening and morning a second day. Evening and morning a third day. Comes to the fourth day and the sun is mentioned. See, Nachmanides points out that for an adult reader, this should have made a problem. It's why we see parable. I mean, how do you have evening and morning for the first three days if the sun is only mentioned on day four? That is a bit of a problem, don't you think? Yeah. Well, we know the author of the Bible, whether you take the, seems to be the logical approach that's divine, or even if you think the author was a bunch of Bedouins sitting on a campfire at night, which is pretty unlikely. One thing we know, the author was smart. It produced a bestseller, or she produced a bestseller, or it produced a bestseller for thousands of years. So you can't attribute to the fact of the sun appearing on day four to like amnesia or foolishness, right? There's a purpose for it on day four. And the purpose is so that as time goes by and people understand more about the universe, you can dig deeper into the text. And we're told, Nachmanides says, the text may say there is he ediv, but it doesn't say there is evening. Erev, he points out, Ayn Reish Beit, the Shoresh, the root of Erev, the Hebrew word Erev is chaos, mixture, disorder. That's why evening is called Erev, because when the sun goes down, vision becomes blurry. The royal meaning is there was disorder, and Boker is the absolute opposite. When the sun rises, be it, orderly, visit, able to be discerned. And the flow isn't from sunset to sunrise. That's why the, the sun is mentioned on day four. It's a flow from disorder to order, from Erev to Boker, from chaos to cosmos, something that never happens in an unguided system. You may make the statement unequivocally, as I've done at universities literally around the world, order never arises from disorder spontaneously. There must be a guide to the system. That's an unequivocal statement. You have to have no caveats on that. Order cannot arise from disorder by random Reactions. Oh, in probability it can, but the number is so small that physics says it cannot. So you go to the Yama Melech, the salt sea, the dead sea, and say, wait a minute, I see these orderly salt crystals. You're telling me God's there making each crystal? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. But the salt crystals do not arise randomly. They arise because these phenomenal laws of nature that are part of the creation package to force salt crystals to form, that the laws of nature guide the development of the world. It's why the word, the, there are only three creations in the whole six days. The laws of nature do a phenomenal amount of this development that's mentioned in the six days. Otherwise, you'd have creation every other sentence. But you don't. Creation in the first sentence, when the creation of the universe with the laws of nature, nature creation for the nephesh of animals, creation for the neshamer of humans. And those are the creations. 
the laws of nature are able to guide with it. You know, God steps in and redirects nature, but you don't have to have major changes in the universe because it's set up already. So the Torah wants you to be amazed by this flow of order, starting from a plasma, chaotic plasma, and ending up with a symphony of life, and day by day going to higher and higher levels, out of order, out of disorder. And, I mean, it's pure thermodynamics, but stated in terminology of 3,000 years ago, and interpreted 800 years ago by Nachmanides, who says, this, he says, it's not my idea, he says, I got it from my teachers, who got it from their teachers going back. So we have order arising out of disorder. And then the days are numbered. The days are numbered. There are evening and morning. And it's the discontinuity in the way the days are numbered that gives the answer that has been used for understanding the age of the universe. Each day is numbered. There is evening and morning, day one. But the second day doesn't say there is evening and morning, day two, does it? It says there is evening and morning, a second day. Evening and morning, a third day, fourth day, fifth day, the sixth day. But for the first day, the text does not say, Vihi Erev Evoka Yom Rishon. There's evening and morning a first day. It says, Vihi Erev Evoka Yom Echad. There's evening and morning, day one. Now, there are many English translations that make the mistake of writing a first day. And that's clear why. Because editors want consistency. And human editors want things to be nice and consistent. So they weren't to throw out the cosmic message to make people feel comfortable. But the text carries a cosmic message. There's evening and morning, day one, because there is a qualitative difference, as Nachmanides brings down, between one and first. One is absolute, first is comparative. Now Rashi brings a philosophical meaning for day one, the day of the one. Nachmanides brings the physical meaning of day one. Day one, he tells us, comes to teach us that time was created. That there was a creation to time. It's a phenomenal insight that time was created. I mean, I can understand stuff, matter, even space, but time? How do you create time? You can't grab time. You don't even see it. You can see distance and space. You can see stuff and matter. You can feel energy. You can see light energy. Okay, so they have a creation there. But time should be created to understand the esoteric insight from thousands of years ago by having the Torah say there was evening, morning, day one that taught us exactly what Einstein taught us in the laws of relativity. That in fact there was a creation, not just a stuff and space, but to time itself. And that's been recorded by commentators through the ages. And it comes from the statements, in the beginning, and vihi erev evoke, yom echad, day one. And then the interpretation of the text goes further and learns something else from the fact that the Bible says day one. Because one is absolute and not comparative, the text tells us the view of the Bible for those first six days. See, we look at the universe and we say, mm, how old is the universe? Oh, looking back in time, the universe is about, about 15,000 million years old. About 15 billion years old. That's our view of time. But what's the Bible's view of time? How does it see time? Maybe it sees time differently. Oh, maybe. Would it make any difference? Yeah, it makes a big difference. The same Albert Einstein that taught us that time was part of the creation. That Big Bang cosmology brings not just space and matter into being, but time, space, and matter, teaches us that time is part of the nitty-gritty, that time is a dimension, that time is affected by your view of time, that how you see time depends upon where you're viewing it and how you're viewing it, that, if you, that a minute on the moon goes faster than a minute on the earth that a minute on the sun goes slower, that a time on the sun is actually stretched out. So if you could put a clock on the sun, it would tick more slowly. If you could live on the sun, your heart would beat more slowly. It's a small difference, but it's measurable and measured. It's one of the proofs that the theory of relativity by Albert Einstein is in fact the law of relativity. If you could ripen oranges on the sun, they would take longer to ripen. Why? Because time just goes more slowly. Would you feel it going more slowly? No, 
because your biology will be part of the system. Because wherever you are, your biology is in sync with the local time. That's why you buy a watch.